All right, we want to get started this morning. We're glad you're at Farmington Baptist Church today. Uh, you should find a bulletin there in your pews. Look around. There's plenty scattered around, so pick one up. Notice all the announcements in, <coughs> in the uh, bulletin. Good article in the front. Uh, preacher friend of mine, Brother Randy Davenport, wrote a uh, good article uh, poem there. I think you'll enjoy reading that, Jesus Passed By. So uh, uh, take a few minutes and uh, look over that. On the inside, remember just a few announcements. You'll notice the addresses for uh, Mary Anderson and Charlie Huey, so uh, the uh, nursing home said it'd be fine to send them a card, so I think you could be a real encouragement to, uh, uh, to them, so keep those in mind, and uh, we want to pray for them. Uh, the uh, wedding shower uh, next Sunday afternoon for uh, uh, Logan uh, and uh, Sarah, so remember that. This Wednesday, the kids are going to the uh, corn maze in uh, Mayfield. You can see Miss Heidi if you got any questions about that. Uh, trunk or treat will be here before you know it, October 31st. And also remember the uh, Operation Christmas Child shoebox uh, event will be a packing party on November the uh, 4th. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. So a lot of things there in the bulletin. So you be sure and notice all the announcements and the things that are going on in the life of our church. We're glad you're here. We want to sing and worship the Lord this morning. So Brother Greg, you and the praise team. Uh, come lead us, brother. All right, good to, good to see you. If you, I believe Wes Smith's having a birthday today, aren't you, Wes? If you would, uh, let's stand up. Stand up and let's, uh, let's sing, uh, There's a Land That Is Fairer Than Day. Good, good you, uh, that you could be here this morning. There's a land that is fairer than day. Faith we can see it afar For the Father went over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirits shall sorrow no more not aside for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above. We will offer the tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen good guy glad you could be here to worship with the lord with us this morning glad you could join us on uh, on Facebook Live, and you can watch later on the Facebook or the, our, the church YouTube channel. Uh, let's continue to worship with uh, Here I Am to Worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you Here I am to worship Here I am to 
to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for the sake became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my First time ever. Well, I'll take that back. Second time. This morning, uh, Adelie sang a, a special uh, for a solo for the very first time. Can I tell this? And uh, Matt and, and Adelie have practiced probably, what, 25, 30 times. I've practiced a bunch. Matt plays the guitar for her. Well, this morning, Matt does it from time to time. He gets a different tune in his head and plays a completely different song. And that happened this morning to Adelie for the very first time that she sang, but she was a trooper, she kept going, and, uh, you know, we all mess up, uh, we all mess up, you know, we love Matt, even when he messes up, um, God always loves us, he knows our mess ups, he knows our faults, and that's the great thing about God, no matter what we do, you know, he has that unconditional love for us, and we should have that same unconditional love for each other, too, because we're, none of us are, are perfect, for sure. All right, we're going to finish up with uh, Shout to the Lord. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Seas will roll. 
Brother Chad Puckett, would you lead us, please? Amen. You can be seated. God, I give you all I can today The scattered ashes that I hid away I lay them all at your feet From the corners of my deepest shame Empty places where I've worn your name Show me the love I say I believe Oh, help me to lay it down Oh, Lord, I'll lay it down Oh, let this be where I die, my Lord with Thee, crucified, be lifted high. 
is my kingdom's fall Once and for all Once and for all There is victory in my Savior's loss And in the crimson flowing from the cross Pour over me Pour over me My Lord with Thee Crucified Be lifted high Is my kingdom's fall Once and for all Once and for all Oh Lord, I lay it down Oh Lord, I lay it down Help me to lay it down Oh Lord, I lay it down My Lord with Thee Crucified Be lifted high Is my kingdom's fall Once and for all Once and for all Oh, once and for all Once and for all Amen. We appreciate Miss Adley. She did a wonderful job. I know we're all proud of her, and we appreciate her singing for the Lord this morning. We're going to be in the book of Acts today, Acts chapter number 14. Hope you have your Bibles with you today. Acts chapter number 14. We're going to be reading verses 18, 19, and verse number 20. The book of Acts chapter number 14. And I want us to think about this thought today. Is revival still possible in our churches? Is revival still possible in our churches? Book of Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas are in a little town uh, called uh, Lystra. And uh, we're going to see what happened here in Acts 14 and verse number 18. The Bible says, And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And notice Acts 14, 19. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persecuted the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the day. Lord, thank you for the 9 o'clock service we had. Father, the times of worship, the fellowship, each part of the service is important. 
And now, Lord, we came, come to the preaching of your word, the teaching of the scriptures. Father, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear what the word has to say today. Forgive us of our sins. May Jesus be lifted up. That's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, Acts 14 is revival still possible in our churches. You know, we look around the world today and we all realize our world is getting worse and worse and worse. Every year it seems like things, uh, uh, new things are happening. We're just... Uh, continually uh, tilting the wrong way. If, if your grandparents, if your great-grandparents could come back today and listen to the radio, see what was on television, watch the internet, they might not know what the internet was, but see the things that are online, they'd be shocked in just a few generations how much we've changed, how we've went backwards morally in our nation. And we look and we see things are getting worse and worse. The devil's attacking our churches more and more. On top of all of that, culture continually getting more and more sinful. With COVID, our churches are all running about half strength. And so our churches are getting weaker. Our culture's getting worse and worse. And we just get pessimistic. It's just easy. I meet so many Christians, so many church members, so many pastors who are pessimistic. Man, we're never going to see God work again. Our churches are just continually going to decline. They're ready to throw in the towel. They're ready to give up. And I want to tell you, I want to encourage you today. Is revival still possible? I believe it is. I believe God, even though things are bad in our country today, in our culture today, God can still work. In our midst. Now we're going to look right here at Acts 14. And I want to encourage you from the scriptures. Keep your ribbon here. You stay, those of you watching online, we appreciate you. You stay with us. I want to give you three points this morning that I think will be a help to you. If you're jotting notes, and I've got a short attention span too, it helps you pay attention, I promise you. If you're jotting down notes, I want to give you three S's. I want you to see number one, the struggle that Paul and Barnabas had. The same struggle they had in the town of Lystra. It's the same struggle we have today. I want you to see, number one, their struggles. I want you to see, number two, their strategy. What did Paul and Barnabas determine to do? It's the same thing all of us as Christians, as churches, we need to be doing today. The strategy, number two. And then number three, the success. Did it work? Will it work today? Three S's this morning. The, the, uh, the struggles, the strategy and the success. What are we talking about? Well, let's notice this morning. Notice, first of all, the struggle. We saw it in verse 19, and even if you back up to verse 12 in Acts 14, you notice the Bible says in Acts 14, verse 12, the people of Lystra, it says they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker. The people were confused. They thought Paul and Barnabas were Roman gods come down to earth. They thought Barnabas was Jupiter and Paul was Mercury. They were confused about who they were and what they were doing and what they were saying. So many today are confused about the Word of God. So many, even here in the Bible Belt, are confused about the way to heaven. They're confused about the gospel. How many people do we meet and they'll say, well, you know, things like me and God's got a deal. We got a deal and I'm going to be all right. You know, I give some money to the church. My name's on the church row somewhere. Back when I was a kid, I got baptized. You know, I took the Lord's Supper from time. They got all these. None of those things will work. None of those things will get you to heaven. People say, well, you know, I'm just as saved as the next person. I'm just as saved as that person over there. Well, that person over there ain't the standard. Your neighbor ain't the standard. God's going to deal with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You will stand and give an account to God for yourself. Your spouse won't give an account for you. Mom or daddy, your kids, God deals with us as individuals. People have, are so confused about how to get to heaven, about the salvation, about the gospel. And so we look around the world and they're so confused about things. And then we've got half of them are confused and then half of them are mad at us. Matter of fact, they were so mad at Paul. Did you notice in verse 19? Acts 14 verse 19. It says they stoned Paul and they drew, they dragged him out of the city supposing, thinking that he was dead. 
Not only were half of them confused, the other half were so mad, they picked up rocks and they threw them at Paul till they knocked him out. He was unconscious. And they picked up his body and they took him out of the town of Lystra and they threw him in a ditch. Thought he's dead, we're done with him. Well, he was just unconscious. But they nearly stoned him to death. The world, and Paul, he's dealing with the culture. Half the people are confused. Half of them are opposing. They're angry. And it's just like 2020, isn't it? It's just like the 21st century. We look around and so many people are confused about Jesus, about the church, about what the gospel is all about. And the other half are mad at us. When we say things like, we just believe the Bible. We believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And that's what the Bible teaches. The, the big word now, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no salvation in any other person. Neither is there salvation in, in, in any other. For there is no other name written among heaven whereby we might be saved. No other way to be saved. Jesus is the only way to be saved. That makes people furious. I can't believe you Christians. I can't believe you Baptists are that narrow-minded. We just believe what the Bible says. Jesus said no man comes to the Father. Jesus believed that. That's why old uh, C.S. Lewis said Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's the Lord of glory. You got one of three choices. Either he was a liar and he claimed to be somebody he wasn't. Either he was crazy as a loon, he was a lunatic. Well, he's exactly who he said he was. He's the Lord of glory. And the world hates that. When we say it, we've seen it this week. It was all over the news how, you know, an eight-year-old person, an eight-year-old boy or girl, they've got the right to want to change genders. Well, that eight-year-old boy, if they want to be a girl, nobody can say anything, you know. It's all right, that eight-year-old boy, he can just start dressing as a girl and acting like a girl and vice versa. But I like what somebody said. They said, when I was eight, year old, eight years old, my parents wouldn't even let me cut my own hair, pick out my own haircut. I mean, that's just ludicrous. But that's what the world is going to. I mean, we keep on, as one person said, slouching more and more toward Gomorrah. Things we wouldn't have dreamed of a decade ago, a generation ago, getting worse and worse. And we as Christians, we say, no, no. Genesis said God made them male and female. That's how God made it. That was God's plan. And the world says, we hate you for that. We don't like you. Jesus said this. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you too. And the world is opposed, uh, you know, regardless of politics. I'm not being political, but I want to tell you, every one of us, if we went to, went to Washington, D.C., and we said we believe what we believe, they turn against us. They hate people that believe the Bible, that say we believe God said it, and that settles it. There's so much opposition today among Christians, among Bible believers. But that same opposition has been down through the ages. Our Anabaptist forefathers were burned at the stake, drowned in the rivers, fed to the lions. Our Baptist forefathers in America, you can read about it. They were fined. They were beaten. They were thrown in jail. They were persecuted left and right. Our forefathers have been through hard times. But they didn't give up. And we shouldn't either. Opposition to Christianity has always been around. Paul, there was so much opposition. People picked up rocks. And they threw him at the Apostle Paul till they almost killed him. They knocked him unconscious, took him out of the city, and threw him in a ditch. That's pretty good opposition. But notice what Paul did. In the midst of that opposition, and this didn't happen just one time. It happened multiple times to Paul in different cities. But notice his strategy. In that kind of confusion and opposition... What does Paul do? Look at verse 15. I love this verse. Acts 14 verse 15. Paul looks at this crowd of people. Half of them are confused. Half of them are mad. And Paul says, Sirs, Acts 14, 15. Why do, we do, these, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you. And then notice the middle part of the verse. He says, We preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Paul's strategy was to preach the gospel. Paul's strategy was to preach the word of God. He uses the word vanities. He says you've got to turn from your vanities. We don't use the word vanity in West Kentucky a lot, but it's in the Bible quite a bit. Matter of fact, it's in the book of Ecclesiastes 
28 times. The word vanity means emptiness. Something that's worthless. Something that's empty that doesn't count. Paul is looking at that crowd and he says, Listen, the things of this world are vanities. The things of this world, you fill in the blank, they will never satisfy. They will never give you that peace that passes all understanding. You'll always got to have something else. You'll always be looking for something to fill that void. The book of Ecclesiastes Solomon, you, Solomon, now you think about somebody who knew what he was talking about. People th- say all the time, well, if I had a little more money, I'd be happy. Boy, if I could just have a little more money. Listen, Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived. Have you ever seen pictures of the Middle East? Palestine, man, there's rocks everywhere. The Bible says Solomon had so much gold and silver, that he had so much silver, that silver was as common in Israel as stones were. Now that'd be something if you said silver was as common in Graves County as, as rock. But you, may, you see what it's like over there. There's rocks everywhere. Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived. And he said, vanity of vanities. That wealth didn't give me happiness. That wealth didn't fill that void. People say, well, if I could just get me a new wife, if I could just get me a new husband, if I could just have another relationship, I'd be happy. Solomon had 700 wives. And that wasn't right. It was wrong, and he, it caused him trouble. But he had 700 wives. All is vanity. Vanity of vanities. Relationships can't fill that void. People say, well, if I could get a little more learning. Man, I, I just love to read and study and learn. If I could have more knowledge, I'd be happy. Solomon's the wisest man who ever lived. Wrote the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Wiser than anybody but Jesus. Vanity of vanities. It's all empty. If I had more power, Solomon had ruled over the largest kingdom in the history of Israel. More territory than David, more territory than Uzziah, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, the largest kingdom. Vanity of vanities. What Saul and what Paul and Barnabas they're telling the people is listen, the things of this world, they don't fulfill your needs. Every person is made in the image of God. Every person has a God-shaped hole and nothing will fill that void in your life but the Lord. Vanity, turn from your vanity. For a person to be saved, you've got to want to be saved. You've got to realize, listen, this emptiness in my life, I I want something to fill it. I need something to fill it. We've got to turn. You ought to underline that word turn in Acts 14 verse 15. We've got to, to, to be saved. You've got to turn from your sin and turn to the Savior. Turn to Jesus in faith. That's how a person gets saved. We're not saved by baptism. We're not saved by communion, the church, good works, good deeds, or money. We're saved by faith in Jesus. Everybody in the Bible got saved the same way they got saved. How was Zacchaeus saved? He looked to Jesus in faith. How the thief on the cross get saved? He looked to Jesus in faith. How that old jailer man, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Everybody, we're saved by faith. Turning from our sin and turning to the Savior. Paul looks at those people, that was his strategy. Y'all got to turn to Christ. And he tells them along with this, his strategy is to preach the gospel and remind them of the goodness of God. You see that in verses 15, 16, and 17. He talks about that. You notice, for example, in verse 17, Acts 14, verse 17, Paul says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without a witness, in that he did good, talking about God did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. I'm going to tell you, God is good. God is good all the time. God has blessed every one of you. He's given you health. Your health is a gift from God. Your breath is a gift from God. The brains that you have to figure out problems, to get by in day-to-day life, it can be gone like that. We see it all the time. They're a gift from God. Your home, your bed, the roof over your head, everything you have is a gift from God. God is good. And God is so good. Not only does He bless us, And all kinds of blessings he rains down on us. But he's so good he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. That's why the Bible says in Romans the goodness of God leads to repentance. I would tell you today if you're lost and you're not not a Christian, you're watching online, you've never been saved. 
Man, God is good. God loved you. He died on the cross for you. You can be saved. All your sins can be forgiven. You can finally have peace with God. Not again through the church, through good works or something. Jesus already did the work. He died on the cross. He paid the debt. He suffered for sins. All you've got to do is believe in your heart. I tell young people all the time, salvation's like ABC. You've got to admit you're a sinner. A for admit. I know I've sinned. I know I've done wrong. God, I know I'm a sinner. I admit my sin. You've got to believe in your heart, not with your head, with your heart. You've got to believe in your heart. I believe Jesus died. I believe he rose again. I, I want him to save me. I believe he can save me. And see, you've got to call. Call upon the name of the Lord. Ask the Lord to come into your life. Ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. Turn from sin to the Savior. That was Paul's strategy. He's being oppressed. Half the people are confused. Half of them's picking up rocks to throw at him. But that Paul and Barnabas, their strategy is to preach the gospel. Does it work? You say, well, preacher, I don't see a whole bunch of people getting saved in this chapter. But let's take a closer look because I want you to notice the success. Look there, for example, at the fourth word in Acts 14, 20. Verse 20 says, How be it as the disciples. That's not talking about Barnabas, that's plural. People got saved in the town of Lystra. Paul was outside uh, unconscious in that ditch and he woke up. And there were Christians around him. People got saved in the town of Lystra. When the word of God is preached, it works. I don't know how many people got saved. But again, the word disciples in plural, more than one. And let me tell you how, how much God worked. When Paul comes back to the town of Lystra, he picks up a companion, a, a preacher friend. Acts 16 verse 1, the fellow's name, you've heard of him, is Timothy. Timothy was from the town of Lystra. I don't know if he got saved here. His mama or his grandmother, Lois or Eunice, got saved. But people got saved. Timothy is from the town of Lystra. God did something. The word of God is powerful. The Bible says in Isaiah that God said, My word shall not return unto me void. It's going to accomplish what I want it to. God's word worked. Paul preached in Lystra. Disciples got saved. Timothy comes from the town of Lystra. You say, well, preacher, I've never heard of the church at Lystra. Well, you have. You just didn't know it. Now, you've heard of the church at Rome, the book of Romans. You've heard of the church at Ephesians, uh, Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. The church at Theodicea, uh, 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 book of Thessalonians. But what about the church at Lystra? Well, the book of Galatians is not written to one church. You go to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 2. It's written to a group of churches, a fellowship of churches, an association, if you will. It's written in Acts 1 verse 2 to the churches of Galatia. And guess what's one of those, one of those churches was the church at Lystra. It worked. People got saved. Disciples. Timothy comes from this city. A church comes from this city. Paul writes the book of Galatians to them. The word of God shall not return void. People say, well, preacher, I, I don't know if I believe that. I've heard preaching and teaching. It doesn't always work. But here's the thing. Jesus said the word is like sowing the seed. Sometimes the seed falls on the hard ground. Sometimes it gets ate by the birds. Sometimes it falls in the stony ground. Sometimes in the thorns. But every now and then, that seed falls in the good ground. And it brings forth a harvest. It brings forth fruit. God's going to bless the Word. It does. God blesses it all the time. Matter of fact, I was reading this week about a young man from Oklahoma. And you've all heard of him. Uh, he was born, his birth name was Carlos. He was named after a preacher. And uh, Carlos, he had a praying mother. He later said his mother was the best Christian he ever knew. Prayed for him, kept him in church. His father was a drunk. Family ended up getting divorced. The mother moved to California, but she kept Carlos in church. Kept him in church. He got saved. He was 12 years old. He joined the army, joined the military. And he later kind of got away from the Lord, got busy. When he was in the service, they changed his name from Carlos to Chuck. Chuck Norris. And he was named, nicknamed Chuck. And Chuck Norris later said during the making of the movies, the 70s and 80s, 
his mama was constantly talking to him on the phone. Chuck, I'm praying for you. God's got a plan for you. And he said he was so busy, just kind of, he never, you know, he, he said he just kind of got away, kind of got backslid from the Lord. And one day he was with his wife and he came in and he said his wife Gina was at the table reading the Bible. And his first thought was, man, what, is she getting religious? What's going on? And she said, you need to, Chuck, you should be reading the Bible with me. Come here and look at this. And he said he got in and began to read the Bible and it transformed his life. He's never been the same since then. Faithful member of a Baptist church in Dallas, Texas. The Word of God is powerful. Man, it'll save the lost. It'll bring the backslidden back home. It'll grow Christians. It made a difference in Chuck Norris's life. He'll tell you, you can go online and read all about it. It made a difference in his life. It'll make a difference in your life as well. Our job as Christians, man, we're going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to, as a pastor, as a preacher, man, I'm going to preach it every time you come to church. We're going to preach and teach the Word of God. Man, your job as Christians, our job as believers, man, let's talk talk about the Bible with our family members, our kids, our grandkids, our people we work with, we go to school with. Let's have gospel conversations. Let's talk to them about Jesus. Let's invite them to church where they can hear the Word of God. So many people say, well, there's churches declining all around us. And I'll tell you why, because so many preachers are just sitting there coasting. I mean, they're just riding it out. Going to ride it till it dies. But God has called us to be faithful. Faithful even unto death. I don't know what next year will bring. Man, there may even be more opposition to us. People, it's amazing. We can, I can preach this message on Facebook. Nobody says anything. Preach it on YouTube. Nobody tries to take it down. They may do that next year. But God has called us to be faithful. Let's keep on preaching the gospel. Because so many people here in West Kentucky, man, they're looking to drugs. They're trying to fill that God-shaped hole. But they're empty. They're looking to alcohol. They can't feel that God show. They're looking to this relationship, that relationship. They're, that, man, if I get a new boat, a new Z71, get this. But they can't feel that God-shaped hole. Our job as Christians, we point them to the Savior. The only way you'll ever have peace, the Bible says a peace that passes all understanding. The only way you'll ever find that peace is in Jesus. The one who loved you so much, he died on the cross for you. Let's keep pointing people to Jesus. Let's keep inviting them to church where they can hear the gospel preached. Let's keep on serving Jesus. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you've never been saved, don't put it off any longer. Today, today is the day of salvation. You can be saved today. Christian, you keep on being faithful. You keep on staying in church where you can serve God. You keep on being the light and salt, being a lighthouse in a generation that's dark and getting darker. God's called us to be light. You keep on being that light and salt. Keep on pointing people to Jesus. Let's all keep on being faithful. And God will bless us. Let's pray.